I'm not sure um, quite, you know, how we're going to organize this. Uh, what quite chronologically in this context means, does this mean I'm older than all one? Uh, which is a monstrous proposition. But anyway, uh, I think what Alban and I have agreed to do um, is that we will try to speak for 20 or 25 minutes each and then give you lots of time to ask us questions, hard or otherwise. And the division of labour which we have come up with is that um, I will say something about what I will very grandiosely call the theory of local history although as you will see it's not quite as, as, as bad as it sounds uh, and all one will talk about the practice of local history so that hopefully the two bits will blend uh, uh, and we have some sort of broad overview of what is local history and how can we go about doing it and we hope the conversation when we finished will be uh, around those things. Um, Steve is quite right of course, that is local history is popular, and not just in this country. Um, we, uh, uh, as you know, our uh, our daily lives are continuously ruled by metrics. Uh, so, in order to try and understand how popular local history really is, uh, I went to the the master of the metrics, and that is, I googled the phrase local history, <laughs> and I got 5.25 billion hits. Not million. I'm going to say that again because it took me a while to take it in as well. That's 5.25 billion hits on Google for the phrase local history. So that's a measure uh, uh, of what we're dealing with here. That this is a, a thing which is universally popular and indeed uh, in recent years uh, has grown dramatically in its popularity. Of course, it's, it's what you Google uh, uh, depends on the words that you want to use for this thing. Uh, and of course, historians love playing with terms, uh, despite the fact that they say, oh, we're not really interested in those sort of games. Um, uh, we're not really interested uh, in what we call this. Uh, and we're not, we're, we're good historians, we don't worry too much uh, about dates and, and things like that. Uh, uh, but in fact, that's what historians do. I mean, they argue about turning points, they argue about when things change, that dates do matter, and terms do matter. Many of you will remember uh, uh, when you were younger, we all had uh, uh, domestic industry uh, in this country, and then suddenly we had proto industrialization uh, 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 afterwards. Uh, so the words, terms do matter. Uh, and, you know, the term local history conjures up, uh, I think, in people's minds, uh, a series of associations. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's a term which people use. They use all sorts of other terms which I think mean almost exactly the same thing. Um, we talk about local history, yes. Um, we talk about microhistory, which, to my mind, uh, is the same thing. Uh, uh, under a slightly different scale. We talk about regional history. Um, we talk uh, about um, urban history, which is, if nothing else, simply the study of a town, uh, and therefore is a study of the local. So there are all these terms which we bandy about um, to mean what I think is more or less the same thing. And this, of course, I immediately raises a question of why are there all these different terms for what seems to be essentially the same sort of thing. And it seems to me that the reason that historians have invented these terms um, for the same thing uh, springs from a sort of embarrassment. Um, and it's because local of the way in which local history arose I think local history of course grew out of uh, the sort of antiquarian tradition uh, from the 17th century onwards uh, but particularly of course in the 19th century uh, with that explosion uh, of explorations uh, of the local and regional past uh, by the gentry in uh, Ireland now the nature of these people meant that this veered very close, and indeed sometimes was, what we would now describe as antiquarianism. 
uh, and that love of history has been tainted with this phrase uh, of antiquarianism, which those who would wish to think of local history perhaps in another way uh, have had to try and escape by thinking of these other terms that we can apply for it. Uh, and that therefore the existence of these various terms for the study uh, of the local past I think suggests that while there is one idea in people's minds, the part of the problem lies in articulating that, that idea to try to remove it from the antiquarian tradition of the 19th century um, uh, and to try and establish uh, something which is usable uh, for our own day. I suppose for that reason uh, we should begin by going backwards and by going backwards to what we might describe as the definitions uh, of local history. Uh, to think about how people in the past have thought of, the, of, of, of local history. And the classic definition, certainly of scholarly local history, um, lies with H.P.R. Finberg, first uh, professor of English local history in what became known as the Leicester School. And Finberg, uh, in 1952, uh, when he gave his inaugural lecture as professor of English local history in Leicester, define local history like this. And he said, the business of the local historian then, as I see it, is to reenact in his own mind, first thing, reenact in your own mind, uh, and to portray for his readership, that's the second thing, so the importance is not simply to tell the story, but to tell the story to lots of people, uh, to portray for his readers the origin, growth, decline, and fall of a local community. And in Finberg's formulation, all those words, origin, growth, decline, fall, and local community, all got capital letters. They were the key words in his definition. Now it's easy to see how Finberg was being influenced uh, by some of the wider historiographical traditions of its day. I mean, the, the origin, growth, decline, and fall, you can see the hand of Oswald Spengler, uh, uh, who had this grand theory in, in the 1930s that, that societies rose and fell and the business of the historian was, was to chart this. So, you know, S uh, Finberg was not uh, entirely um, uh, immune from uh, the wider historical ideas. So, that classic definition um, about the origin, growth, decline and fall uh, of a local community it, it is, is something which remains very much what local historians think they're doing. In, in a simpler, a more simplified form of that definition is this, that local history is the story, okay, it's, it's a story, it's not simply a collection of evidence, it's not an antiquarian tradition, it's a story of a group of people in a particular place over time. That's a more modern version of that. And a third, um, uh, definition, I suppose, is, is what Edward Royal, uh, writing in the Fesh script uh, for John Marshall, uh, uh, <coughs> one of the perhaps lesser known, but, but one of the seminal figures uh, in English regional history, um, a professor of English regional history in uh, uh, Lancashire, um, who was a seminal figure in, in, in shaping how we think about not the very local but the wider regional past. And Edward Royal says this in John Marshall's Fetchcliffe, the historian is or should be concerned primarily with the view from the bottom. What a region meant to a person who lived there uh, and this is expressed in human activities. So looking at human activities is a way of how people shaped their world around them. And that's how we can measure uh, uh, what they thought about their world. Uh, that the term uh, of royal want, uh, region royal wanted to insist uh, was provisional. Uh, that regions were not God-given things. We all think of, you know, we all did regional geography at school. Uh, we think of regions as fixed things. Uh, um, Edward Roy was very clear that how John Marshall would have thought about regions was not in that fixed way. That regions were, and I quote again, um, were a term of convenience, locally 
uh, spe uh, located specifically in time and in space with no more than a temporary existence. Uh, so regions are continually changing. They are zones of human activity, he talked about them. Indeed, he called them uh, communities of interest. He talked about people, uh, sorry, he talk, yes, he, he talked about communities of interest and he talked about the other uh, great idea from 19th century history, the idea of the imagined community. That they were, they were, in, that these ideas or regions are invented by people who live in them to express that something. So it seems to me that those are the sort of range, we could go on and on with these sort of definitions, but it seems to me those are the sort of ranges of how local people doing local history, in its broadest sense, have thought about what they are doing. Uh, and that this is, they, these are the questions which they thought are important to address. Uh, the origin, growth, decline, fall of a local community, uh, the story of a group of people, uh, and a view of how people expressed their sense uh, of where they were, their imagined community. Now, it seems to me there are two very important characteristics of all these definitions regardless of which one of those you take. But there are two uh, things, and these are the two defining things of local history. The two things which shape how we think about the local past. And they are, what defines local history, I think, to my mind, is the question of scale. That's, that's a very important element in local history. The scale on which we work is very significant. And secondly, uh, the idea uh, of space uh, uh, and what goes into that space. That word community, which Finberg used for the first time, um, proved to be a very difficult word for people simply because it was very difficult to find, to, to define a community when everyone was dead. People could tell you about it when they were alive, but when they're dead, it's actually quite difficult to understand how a community wanted. And indeed, the word community has taken on so many meanings and so many um, manifestations over time that it almost means nothing now. And E.P. Thompson was very much in favour of dumping the word completely. Let's look at these two things which I think define local history. First of all, the idea of scale. And secondly, the idea of space. First of all, why does scale matter? Scale does matter. Size matters. Um, why? Because it affects the questions you ask and how you go about answering them. Um, for example, uh, you, when you study very big spaces, very big uh, on a large scale, say a nation or a country, um, then uh, what you are doing effectively is limiting your questions. You are limiting your questions because you probably have too much data. Um, you have much too much uh, uh, way, uh, evidence and much too much uh, of a conceptual model to try and fit that into. You're trying to capture hundreds of things, hundreds of experiences in one very small piece of, of, of writing. So therefore, large territories will, will, in a way, limit what you can do. They will restrict your ability to write history. And therefore, you will write history in a very particular way. Smaller territories, however, this is where scale matters. Smaller territories, however, allow you to do other things. They allow you, for example, uh, to integrate a range of experiences into one model or in, into one way of thinking. It allows you to range right across the full experience that people have of living in a particular place in the past, simply because you can read all the evidence. Uh, I, 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 and you can ask a series of questions which will run everywhere from, on the one hand, politics, I know local historians in this country, with the notable exception of David Fitzpatrick uh, and Peter Hart, have been very reluctant to ask political questions of the local. But you, uh, you can write a, a, a study which runs everywhere from that world of high politics in the regions, right the whole way across 
to a, a cultural world and to try to make those diverse elements meet together is the task of the local historian. Now there are of course dangers in this. I mean the danger of course is that if you are focusing on uh, smaller territories, on smaller places, then what you end up with, with John, as John Marshall described uh, many years ago, is the tyranny of the discreet. You end up with a series of simply, and there are blue spots here, and blue spots here, and red spots here, and red spots here. That it becomes very difficult to integrate these individual case studies into a wider framework and that is a danger that you know is real in looking at local history. There's also a danger in the sort of questions which you might ask because there is an inherent tension uh, in doing this sort of very localized study um, simply because uh, you will end up or you can end up by thinking of it in two ways. You can either think of it as national questions localized, in other words, a sort of case study type approach, that the questions which you want to address are framed at the center, they are questions which are framed at the level of the nation, and then someone wants to try it out in a smaller place to see will it work. And there's a long and noble tradition of that in this country, of people who have a grand theory, and you've all read these books, you know, which in their first paragraph set out a very grand theory, and they say, and now we will turn to the northern part of the townland of Akhtabachi, and we will examine that. So that, that where national questions simply become localized, rather than trying to examine local societies in their own way. That is a danger. We, some people in, in uh, certainly as local history developed, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, in England, people like Finberg and later Hoskins were very aware of that, that danger, and they wanted to insist very clearly that local history was not about taking national questions, questions of industrialization or big questions like that, and applying it to small areas to get results to test. Uh, uh, result. That it was not about that. It was beginning at the bottom and working your way up rather than working from starting at the top and working your way down. So that what should happen when you try to understand a, a local society is that local society, so that study should end up posing questions which then force people who work at a national level to rethink their picture. And, and there are a number of studies, particularly Finberg's uh, contributions to Anglo-Saxon England, that was his speciality, um, uh, where what happened in his local studies forced those who, who drew the big picture of Anglo-Saxon to change their mind completely. So that the flow of questions was coming not from the top down, but from the bottom up, and in fact it was the local that was modifying and setting the agenda for national history, rather than the other way around. There are ways, of course, that we can deal with, with, with this problem. One of the most effective ways, which, again, in this country we haven't really developed, um, is rather than thinking of discrete units, um, you know, we all tend to think, when we think of our global history, of standard, stable, sealed communities in which people do not move around. This is a myth. This is nonsense. Uh, uh, the reality is that people are continually on the move, um, that there is no fixed picture which you end up with a whole series of studies which won't quite meet. One way to deal with that tyranny of the discrete is to try to think comparatively. Um, the classic model of this, of course, in the uh, English uh, situation is uh, Mark Spofford's contrast in communities. Um, where you ask a question, why is this place not like that place? And you begin to compare them. Uh, so that we, begin, we, we deal not just in the discrete, but we deal in the comparative. Now, as I say, very few people in this country um, have, have, have done this. The most obvious body uh, uh, which has been involved in this uh, is the Irish Historic Times Atlas, 
where at one level it is a project which is the tyranny of the discreet, many of you I'm sure know the Irish Historic Times Atlas, um, which attempts to produce atlases for the major Irish towns, looking at their evolution from the earliest times to 1900. And what we have is a series of fascicles about individual towns. But complementing that, there are a series of books called Maps and Texts, more Maps and Texts, which actually try to ask the question, why is, why is Down Patrick not like Belfast? Why is Down Patrick not like Carrick Fergus? Why is Carrick Fergus not like Belfast? They're all the product of a <coughs> colonial environment. They're all the product of a very similar, broader context. But this is shaped, and this is shaped in very particular ways, and this only becomes clear when you actually become comparative. So scale matters. Scale allows comparison. And it allows comparison over a very wide range of variables. So scale, it seems to me, is, is a very important element in this. The second word that I want to say a little bit about before I shut up is this idea of space. Now, by space, what I mean is what makes something local? Um, now, there is, of course, a problem here because the traditional, uh, and I say traditional because this is the way I suspect many of you would think of it, is that the traditional local study uh, is driven by space. It's driven by a sense of place. It's driven by beginning your study by picking a particular space, whether it's the space you live in or a space you happen to be particularly interested in, and what you then do is you look at that space. But if you look at those definitions that I started off with, they very rarely talk about space. What they talk about are groups of people. That the local, in a sense, the importance of local history uh, is not the study of particular places, which of course is the term used with Victoria County history some years ago. It's not studies of particular places. It is studies of groups of people. Now, groups of people are much more complicated. This is when we talk about communities, i.e. groups of people. This opens up, I think, all sorts of possibilities for us. As I said to you before, people move around. Uh, people take ideas. Is local history a, a, an isolated uh, uh, series of small studies? How do we link local history with national history, and indeed nowadays increasingly with global history? Or is local history something which is happily ghettoized and can be left to its own devices? And I think the reality is that, that by thinking of what we study, not as studying places, but studying groups of people, we're opening up these sort of possibilities. Because as people move around, for example, they move between one place and another, and they take ideas with them. These are people who we can call brokers, people who carry ideas from one place to another, and shape those ideas in particular local contexts. So if you think uh, about uh, you know, a, a lawyer in the 19th century, uh, or a, a priest, centrally trained, um, either in Maynooth or in King's Inns in Dublin, but yet the law and religion um, are two of the most variable things. They are not standard products. They are the product of someone taking ideas from one place and bringing it to another. So that these ideas of brokers, people, groups of people linking local societies rather than local places. <coughs> and of course this, this we have all been practicing for years. You have all been practicing it for years. You may not have thought of it. It's called genealogy. Because the potential for genealogical constructs, for thinking of genealogies, not as collections of names, but rather as elements within communities, of people within communities, of people who shape local places and are shaped by them, that, that, that is a very important way of thinking. That is a very important bridge which links local history, broadly defined as I've talked about, with this study which, you know, so I am told is even larger than local history on the internet, the study of genealogy. 
and that it forces you to think about not simply about your family tree, but how family trees fit together. And what we're talking about here essentially are local societies, the members of which are moving between different worlds and carrying world ideas with them and shaping local communities in their own way. So what we're really talking about is, is an idea that Eston Evans talked about many years ago. We're talking of, not about local places, but about local personalities. Why is one place different to another? Um, one very, I think, very interesting study, one, I think one of the most interesting things that has emerged in recent years is the study of town lands. Because suddenly we have realized that over very short distances, societies can vary enormously. Um, Bill Crawford, many years ago, did Townlands in Ulster. There was that Irish Townlands book. But across very small uh, uh, areas, there were radically different uh, changes in the character of societies. In some places, they were closed communities. You couldn't get in. Other places, two miles up the road, they were open. People are moving in and out all the time. So this shapes the way in which we think about our local society. But we only understand that if you start thinking about you know, local history, not as a study of a place, not as a study of, of, of a, 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 a space, but rather as a group of people shaping their world. Okay, I, I, I've said enough for the moment now, but hopefully we will have an opportunity after all this talk about the practicalities of this, uh, we'll have a chance to talk about some of these ideas and some of the problems in the plan. Thank you. Would I, uh, would I speak about local history following Ray Gillespie? I thought somebody was having a cruel joke. I mean, who could ever follow Ray Gillespie talking about local history? Um, I really felt I had very little to add, but it's, the, the tenor of the email was along the lines, well, you could talk a little bit about public history as well, and how that might relate to, to local history. Uh, and then Ray and I talked about me also offering some practical examples. Um, so I'm going to try and do both those. Uh, what I want to really do for the next the short while is just to follow on from, from some of those thoughts about local history uh, and talk about my own sort of journey into to looking at public history and how the two actually might be closer than, than, than we often think. Um, it, being asked to, to, to come here this evening has actually forced me to think back to my own experience of, of, of local history, as both as an academic, as, as an individual and as a teacher. Um, thinking about how I first became involved with the concept of local history, but um, where I've actually come from tonight, um, this evening is, is uh, this poster exhibition that our master's students now run in, in public history. Um, and that's sort of almost, for me, in some ways the end point of my journey through local history and into public, but also it's, it's brought me full circle because I realised that the two are much, much closer um, than I maybe at first even thought. Um, and I would, and there are those within my institution who feel that I've sort of left local history uh, abandoned it in, in favour of this sort of new shiny concept that is public history, but actually my argument would be that the two are very, very close, uh, closely intertwined and, and perhaps even you can't really properly have one without the other. Um, I'd say at a very basic level, one of the things that public history and local history um, have in common is that their prefixes instantly set them at odds with and in contrast to history, academic history, um, you know, I think Ray's alluded to that earlier, um, this idea of them being different in some way from scholarly or academic history. Um, certainly I would say both these approaches, the local and, and public, have been uh, regarded as at times perhaps something of an inferior pursuit to scholarly academic uh, work that happens within universities, um, something practiced by enthusiasts, by amateurs, um, non-experts. Um, certainly, you know, we are aware of the fact that, that, that local history has in the past um, perhaps been viewed in that light. And I, I think um, we have a lot to thank um, <coughs> for and Mignuth for, for really establishing local history firmly where it ought to be, which is that collaboration between the academic, the scholarship, but the community and the local as well, uh, and bringing those two together. 
Um, public history has suffered a very similar fate uh, in terms of being viewed, something perhaps slightly inferior to academic, um, has been regarded as sort of a dumbing down of the discipline. Um, the rise of the, the Twitter story and the telly dawn heralding the demise of serious academic study in the Institute. Um, in 2012, um, Professor Keith Thomas was presenting the Wolfson History Prize um, and he referred to the damage done to diligent scholarship by eye-catching academics, by which he meant public historians. Um, so there is a tendency to see public history and local history as, as history light, perhaps. Um, but I, I'm really so pleased to see over the last couple of decades the way in which the, these different approaches, different ways of approaching the past um, are beginning to, to really be established on university curricula, um, along with other approaches such as family and community history. And we, we're now seeing masters in, in family and community history appearing as well. So I, I think this is really giving these approaches in, in that space. I think another way in which we can talk about the local and, and public <coughs> history in, in similar ways, in, in ways in which they, uh, they share common principles, is their they're very inclusive approach, they're very inclusive approach to how you do history. Um, the fact that best results come when people work together, when academics, enthusiasts, when professional experts, when locals, when individuals bring their different approaches to a particular problem. Um, Public history, like local history, can be seen as that space within which <coughs> the academic <coughs> practice of the discipline meets, meets the public's particular interest in a topic. And, and Raymond talked earlier about stories, and I think it's very much about telling stories and finding different ways to, to tell those stories to a range of audiences. Um, so I, I actually think this idea of, of collaboration should be at, at the heart of what we do. I think it is very fundamental to local history uh, and certainly to public history. So therefore for me, as an academic teaching within a university, I feel there's an onus on me to train up a new generation of, of historians in that practice of working collaboratively with people at the local level, with local communities, with museums, uh, with heritage centres, etc. And actually, providing them with the tools that they will need to, to move forward into this space as well. So what I want to do really then uh, for the next few minutes is, is just to, to talk briefly about the journey I've taken um, through local history from that into to why I'm now teaching an MA in public history um, and, and just share some examples of the kind of work that our students are doing, uh, some of our PhD students and, and finish up with just a couple of examples of work that I've done myself which might just um, hopefully raise some questions you might have about this relationship between the local, the public, the academic historian. So it seems appropriate that I have come uh, from, from that event earlier, my poster um, exhibition, uh, to this because my first foray into local history was my, master, my own master's degree. Um, and. I was very fortunate um, that somebody pointed me in the direction of Mainith and, and Mainith Local History Series for publishing my master's degree. And I think that series, sorry, yeah, that series has been really, really, really important in terms of enabling students to take a discrete body of work and get it out to public audiences. Um, for me, then, whenever I was um, appointed to Queen's, myself and a colleague, Dr. Elaine Farrell, were tasked with the unenviable task of, of, in some ways, trying to replicate what Mainwith were doing uh, in terms of uh, developing a master's degree in local history. Uh, that was no small challenge, let me tell you. Um, we had recognised the, the incredible work that was being done in Mainwith and the real value, and I'm still very aware of that in my own capacity as external examiner, of the real value of the work that's being carried out there. And we felt that that Queen's could perhaps offer something similar. Unfortunately, um, our launch of the, the Masters in Irish Local History at Queen's coincided with an economic downturn and um, also some very aggressive managerial practices, let me say, on behalf of our university authorities, um, which didn't really give uh, the, the degree programme the chance it deserved. Um, and basically, it, it was uh, cut within a very short space of time. Um, 
while that was going on, um, there were things going on in the background uh, for me. Um, the, so the awareness of, of the opportunities that our students might have to work and get experience um, in local communities, in, in local heritage practices, in museums, etc. Um, and actually, the year I started at Queen, Professor uh, Fergal McGarry approached me and said, we, we, we started this new thing last year. It was like um, for a master's in, in NA, or a master's in, in history. It's, um, it's an internship in, in public history. Um, it's had a few problems. We wondered, would you take it on? You know, the newbie, the new kid on the block always gets the, the problems. Um, and I, I wasn't quite sure what it involved. It sounded intriguing and maybe slightly dangerous, but I said yes anyway. Um, and I, I took on this internship um, module as part of our master's, uh, which really gave our students the opportunity to have some practical experience um, out in the real world of history, rather than just in the, the academic ivory tower. Since then, it's been a really, really exciting journey, and we've seen this, this whole way of, of, of doing history grow. Um, and we've seen the programme grow, and then last year, we actually launched um, a standalone master's degree in public history, um, which has been hopefully really successful. At the heart of that program is actually getting our students, as I say, into the workplace. So every year each of our students will do a 30-day placement with a partner. And we are so fortunate to have a, a really wide range of partners, everyone from Prony, who have been fabulous in terms of giving our student experience all the way through the Ulster Museum, Titanic, Belfast, and local museums as well. And increasingly we're finding now students coming wanting to work with community groups and uh, to engage at that very local community level. Um, what this does for students, I think, is to give them a really strong sense of the local, a really strong sense of what makes up uh, the way in which history is understood in a local area and the way in which that history is communicated to and created by the public. And that's one of the things that we experience. Um, they've learned to work alongside individuals, uh, groups, museums, etc. Uh, and they've really learned, I guess, ways in which to build capacity at the local level, importantly, for other people to tell their stories, for local communities, for organisations to, to share their stories with wider audiences. They're also learning, importantly, to deal with some of the competing um, priorities of funders, stakeholders, local communities, politicians, um, how to keep a project going on a shoestring, um, how to bring partners together. Uh, all of those are skills that, that our students are really developing through this. But what I find most rewarding is the way that through their internships they are very much embedded in the local and working with public historians at the local level to tell stories. And what I want to do really is just to, to show you some examples of these are the posters that our students have been exhibiting as we speak. Um, to give you an example of some of the work that they're doing with partners. So one of our students has been working um, with Belfast City Council in Belfast Botanic Gardens, uh, particularly on the uh, restoration of the Palm House. But what the student has done in order to build up the story of the Palm House is actually to bring in local people who have their own memories of that space. Uh, and encourage them to tell their stories, to bring ephemera, to bring photographs, to bring a whole range of things that, that they have. So completely engaging the community from the outset in the developing narrative around the Palm House. Similarly, another student's been working in Nuri and Mourne Museum, uh, specifically on the history of World War I in, in Nuri, uh, and World War II as well. And through, through their work, um, lots of new material, new ideas, new approaches are, are coming to light, um, helping them to really understand the impact of both wars in that particular locality. Um, another couple of examples here, Clifton House, you will hopefully all be familiar with, looking specifically at the experience of poverty. The, work, the student working there has taken a range of archives relating to children in the, the very opening years of the 19th century. Uh, and by working her way through those archives has discovered a lot of ways in which children in Belfast experience poverty uh, and also experience uh, the reality of moving into work uh, and often also being emigrated to other countries. 
So going from the local to the local there, and again, North Down Museum is doing there working with community groups uh, to develop the history of one particular family, um, so that many people again are bringing their stories together and therefore building this multi-layered narrative around that family. Uh, this is another example to throw up here. Uh, students have been working with the Sir Robert Hart uh, Primary School in Portadown. And it's been a really fascinating project because Sir Robert Hart, who became incredibly uh, influential in China, um, and we've got a huge collection of his photographs and papers in Queens. Uh, and what this student has been doing is working with the local school children in the primary school named after him to enable them to actually research and find out a little bit more about him. This is then being turned into a documentary, uh, which is going to be shown in Queen's Film Theatre in a few weeks' time. So again, very much uh, involving school children, which I think is, is a wonderful way to encourage people at, at a young age to really think about their locality, to think about the history of their area and how that might change over time. Um, one of our PhD students then has taken this to Titanic Quarter here uh, several years ago before the, the shiny new hotel uh, was developed. But this is when uh, the drawing offices were the way they used to be. Um, but he did his internship with Titanic Foundation uh, and basically spent several weeks developing oral histories of people connected with the shipyards. I think it was a really interesting project because he brought what he found out, exhibited that, but then used it as an occasion to bring other people who were connected in some way with the shipyard together to tell their stories. And it's very much about enabling and embedding uh, multiple narratives into uh, the history of any particular area. And my current PhD student um, is working on Temple Moor Baths. And this is a heritage lottery funded project to restore the baths. And I think this is a particularly interesting story because what the student is doing is really to try and <coughs> enable local people to give their perspective on the history of these baths. What's happening here is there are various stakeholders, Belfast City Council, uh, the organisation that is repurposing the baths, and there is a historic narrative being built into the story of the baths that's being told. But what you're getting is a very simplistic narrative. You're getting the story of the baths being there to cleanse the shipyard workers, shipyard workers, it's all about that particular group of people and the baths was there for them and, and that is it, that's the extent of the story that's being developed there but what my student is doing is again doing oral history with local people who live in the area getting their input into how they remember the baths, their stories of the baths and bringing multiple narratives in that suddenly raise questions about sectarianism about sectarian divisions in the area, about the physical space and how people understood the space, not just of the baths, but the area around the baths, how it changed over time, it's bringing in questions of gender, of class, lots of things that are really adding complexity to the very simplistic narrative that was going to be there initially. And again, that happens when you have communities and individuals coming together with academics and stakeholders to really delve deeply into the history of the local. So what I want to do now is just to finish up, I could talk all night, sorry, apologies, um, but a project that I've been very involved in, and again, I think why I want to talk about this is it exemplifies what I mean when I talk about bringing the public into what you're doing at a local level, that the local history is never about one individual um, working away on a particular project, it's, it is about community, it is about different groups of people and understanding <coughs> their perspectives on, on the past that you're trying to uncover. My research, as some of you will be aware, focuses very much on poverty and welfare in Belfast in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. As part of that work, um, I became very interested in the 1932 outdoor relief strike. And I became very interested in the stories of individuals who experienced the reality of, of poverty in their streets and in their communities. Um, and how those stories Belfast may have had a very divided landscape at that time, and still does, but there's not a lot of those stories that people had in common, and that commonality is something, I think, that again, local history can really bring to the fore, that we can begin to um, have a better appreciation of what binds us together rather than divides us. So I took this particular moment, the 1932 outdoor relief strike, when Catholics from 
uh, Falls and Protestants from the Shango marched together on Belfast Workhouse to demand um, better conditions on, on the outdoor relief scheme. And what I really wanted to do, I was working with um, playwright Martin Lynch, was to, to bring the locals from the communities that had been involved in those events in 1932 to engage them in a really deep exploration of what life was like in their street at that time and then to involve them in telling that story to wider audiences. So what we did was basically bring groups of young people from East Belfast and North Belfast uh, to Queens, we explained to them the, the, the background to the outdoor relief riots, and then we sent them back to their communities to find out everything they could from their friends, from their families, from their great grandparents, from, from the community members, everything they could about life on their street in 1930s. What was it like to be living in poverty? What was it like to be experiencing unemployment at that time? And then we brought them back to Queens to share, we give them free option to share their stories and what they find um, with an audience, probably about twice the size of this audience, members of staff from Queen's, interested members of the public, and um, two playwrights, Martin Lynch uh, and um, Gary Martin. What they did then was to take the stories that these young <coughs> people had uncovered about their locality and turned it into a play, The People of Gallagher Street, 1932. The play ran for a week in the Mac to a packed out audience um, and give those young people an incredible sense of having of empowerment and having uncovered the story of their locality, their street, and shared this with a wider audience. And I think that exemplifies some of the really excellent practices of collaboration when you're working collaboratively with the people who live in the area that you're interested in. So that to close is what I'm now going to be taking to this place that concept. Uh, this is the van in Jordan. It's an archaeological dig. It's been there for many, many, many thousands of years, but the dig's been there for about 30. Um, but in the shadow of that archaeological dig is a community that has grown up, that is uh, disempowered, that's quite marginalised, economically disadvantaged. And their stories, the sto their stories of that place, and, and I think Ray Raymond talked about place, about space, and about people. The people who are currently living in that particular place in Devan and Jordan, their stories are not included in any narratives of the history of that place. So my role in this project is to, to go there, to work with local school children in um, oral history, in material culture, in visual history, using these different ways of bringing their stories out, and then the students will work with families and friends develop an exhibition which then will be built into the interpretive centre at the archaeological dig. So to me that still has to happen. I'm not sure it's going to work but it's something that excites me and to me it is very much about encouraging local people to tell their stories in a way that really excites public audiences. So well, thank you very much.